Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Greetings and salutations, everyone. You have tuned in to, finally, Dr. Judy WTF, which stands for What the Freud. I'm your host, Walt Lusk, and of course, we have Dr. Judy Rosenberg, the founder of What the Freud, here in studio. We broadcast every Thursday at 8 p.m. Pacific here at the Sunset Gower Studios in Hollywood on ubnradio.com, and you can catch us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, and of course, iHeartRadio. And this being a brand spanking new year, and happy 2017, everybody. <laughs> and, <laughs> and those of you in the audience, this is a call-in show, and you can call in, and the number is area code 323-843-2826. And I have to look at the right camera. I'm getting trained to the wrong one. 323-843-2826, or internationally, you can call us on Skype at UBN, that's Universal Broadcasting Network, UBN Radio number two. And today, we are going to elaborate on something that uh, Dr. G and I talked about a long time ago, and we should have done this a long time ago, but we are going to talk about the Freud of what the Freud, and we have a couple people, Dr. Judy, that want to know really what the Freud is what the Freud what does what the Freud mean? So uh, we're going to talk about Sigmund Freud. We're going to talk about some of the crazy things this doctor did and does and how he really has impacted what's called talk therapy and everything in between. And how he impacted uh, my work and the mind map and the theme of what the Freud. And I thought, New Year, at least let's pay a tribute to yeah, the guy. we need to pay a tribute to and Dr. So, you Sigmund know, Freud. I, I was saying to, to Walt, we've been thinking about this for so long. Yeah. And so it's been kind of a Freudian slip on our part. <laughs> Absolutely. Not to have done this before. So, Sigmund, please excuse us. Okay, we're going to pay, pay tribute to you We're going to do it right today. today. Yeah. So everything you wanted to know about Dr. Sigmund Freud and didn't even know, even about his couch and uh, his cigar and everything in between, um, and a little bit of his theories. So you want to start about what the Freud, or where you want, where you, are we yeah. going to dive in with yeah, do, me, doctor, the good doctor, or where, where are we going? Let, let me just dive in and say the, the WTF that I refer to in the mind map is the repetition compulsion. Which, which, is, which is a Freudian theory. Concept, mm -hmm. correct. And so the reason I refer to WTF is because we keep repeating patterns that unconsciously are not fixed. So when we uh, have a, an emotional ouch, when we have wounds from our past, uh, what happens is that we tend to um, get into patterns that repeat these wounds from the past. And so we'll get into um, bad relationships or we'll get into bad dynamics with um, co-workers and so on and so forth. And so what, what Freud was referring to as the repetition principle was this tendency to repeat things because when the, when the uh, psychological business of the past is not finished, then um, we exhume it. We, ex we exhume it from the darkness. We exhume it from the unconscious. I was going to say, as Dr. Freud would say, the unconscious. Right. Subconscious. The unconscious. Subconscious. And please forgive my voice. Another WTF that I'm experiencing is this horrible cold. I keep rerunning it, so not a good thing. And she gives it to everybody else, and they give it back. Uh, yeah, I think it's <laughs> circulated through a few times. Yeah. So anyway, he's one of my uh, heroes, obviously. There's so much that he contributed yes. to this pr profession from um, dream analysis to drive theory to um, the different stages of um, development, which is, we'll get we're, into. Is different stages of development were very interesting. Very interesting. Yes. And uh, the whole concept of... Uh, 
penis envy yes. and the uh, Electra complex and the uh, Oedipus complex, which we'll get into a little bit more. We are going to touch on that, yes. Right. And, you know, I, I have to say that we've come a long way because when he was doing his work, he was putting patients on his couch for many, many years. And these were wealthy v, uh, Viennese yes, women and Vienna. gentlemen, I believe. Oh, well, women the, too. Women mostly. Yeah, yeah. And they had time and they had money mm-hmm. and they'd go to their analysis and they'd lie on the couch. And then what, what they would do is they would project their feelings onto Dr. Freud. And he wouldn't say much, but he nope. would analyze, analyze, analyze. Yep. He'd take his notes behind the back. Correct. They, they weren't in front of him, kind of, sort of. Right. And then he would analyze the transference, meaning uh, all the negative, positive feelings that they Another concept he developed. Right. Which they, they transferred onto him. Yes. And so then through the, uh, the resolution of the transference, the person would be able to see more clearly and have a better uh, view of reality. And he so, did, did a lot of interpretation of dreams, and that was one of his big books that yeah. really was a, it only sold like 600 copies in the first like eight years. So what I love about him is uh, I, I took the concept of uh, analysis because that's what I do in my work. Absolutely. My team and I, we yep. think, we teach people to think, think like shrinks. Like a shrink. And we're looking at psychological clues as Sigmund Freud did. We're doing a lot of detective work. Yes, as Dr. Judy likes to say, she's a psychological detective. Yeah, that's what it feels like. Right, connecting a lot of dots. And um, one of the uh, aspects of his work that I'm particularly fond of is the idea of the unconscious, the pre-conscious, and the conscious. And I liken that, and I think he did too, to the ocean. So... Below ground is the unconscious world where you don't really understand why you're feeling what you're feeling, thinking what you're thinking, behaving the way you're behaving. And then the pre-conscious is you kind of have a glimmer of why this is going on for you. And then the task of analysis is to bring all that unconscious material up into the conscious he, form he, so that he it doesn't the, rule you. The conscious was the tip of the iceberg. Correct. And the subconscious was the whole bottom part of the iceberg. Yes. I'm trying to bubble yes. it up. And what's interesting is one of the quotes that I use in my book is that uh, it's a quote by Carl Jung that says that. One of his associates. And so, it, well, uh, actually, they hated each other. Well, yeah, well, they came to the United States the one time. Yeah, they did not but like he was a contemporary other. at the same time. Yeah, they were contemporaries. Mm-hmm. But Carl Jung said that unless you make the conscious conscious, It'll rule you, and you you will call it fate. And it's interesting because I think that Freud felt the same way. So they were, in some sense, parallel in their uh, thinking, but they certainly their interpretations were entirely uh, different. Didn't agree. Yeah. On, uh, on, on, we should do a whole series. We on should. Carl, Carl Young. Young. Carl yeah, Young was phenomenal. Man. Yeah. I yeah. didn't realize until I read some stuff that they were around the same time and. Um, uh, Sigmund Freud was invited finally to the United States and spoke uh, back east. Yeah. And uh, he had a lot of coercion because he didn't want to come to America. He didn't like America. Um, and uh, Carl Jung, interestingly enough, came with him. So that was when I figured Maybe out Maybe the were, only they time buddies. they got along. Probably. Right? Yeah. yeah. Short trip. Yeah. So his contribution to the profession of psychology is major. His yes, impact is. on me yes. is big. And the impact on the mind map, it's all there because if you look at the mind map, I'll just uh, interpret it from a Freudian perspective, okay? And uh, tell me when it's up there. It's up. And those of you that are are, uh, listening, you can uh, uh, go to www.drjudywtf.com. Thank you. So the mind map is also a developmental model. So if you look at panel one, that that represents the area era of the preverbal, the mother, infant, connect or disconnect. And so if you look at the darkness and the light, you could see that there are also metaphors for the unconscious and the um, the conscious being the light. And if you look at panel number two, then you could see that the reaction to the wound is also that something that Freud interpreted because he wanted to really deal with um, the symptoms, the primitive symptoms that people exhibit, the anxiety, the depression, and so on. And then the encoding. He wasn't necessarily 
a cognitive behavioral therapist because that didn't exist at the time. Uh, but uh, you see, people interpret their lives according to how they're treated. And so in this case, uh, Freud was big on interpretation, and the mind map is big on interpretation because if we're rejected, if we're not, <coughs> excuse me, if we're not cherished, if we're not unconditionally loved, loved by our family of origin, what happens is we get uh, some horrible conclusions going like, I don't matter, I'm not good enough, um, so on and so forth. I, I work with a lot of people. Who and what are, Dr. Judy calls their core belief. Yeah, yeah. See, these core beliefs are, are ingrained into the fiber of our being, into our unconscious minds. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know that we're sabotaging relationships because we're um, basically believing at our core that we're not lovable or we don't matter. We're not worthy. Or we're not worthy. And it's and what happens with our core belief, if I can throw a little, you know, my interpretation is, then that is our core belief. And so everything that happens to us validates our core belief because, as I like to say, perception is reality. But as like Dr. Judy says, we're looking at it through a cracked lens Correct. of perception. And so what Correct. we need to do is re redo our prescription of our lens, change our perception, change our reality, and change our life. But but it's a boomerang effect yeah. because if a person, let's say, doesn't feel good about him or herself, he or she will project that feeling into the world and then make other people feel awkward mm -hmm. in their presence. If they think that they're stupid, then they'll project it onto the other person and the other person will think, why are you looking at me that way? Or why are you, you know, why are you... Why are you so distant from me? And the truth is, is that they're in their own uh, psychoperceptual view of their crack lens of perception. Okay, and that's why they're doing it. And then because of this weirdness, uh, they trigger off um, um, negative feelings in the other person. And then at the end of the day, that other person feels uncomfortable and let's say walks away. And then the person will say, I knew it. I knew I'm not likable. I, and, I knew and, that I don't yeah. matter. And then I, I like to say that, that it adds important. insult to injury because Correct. you're injured and now you've added to it because of the dynamics. I call it the proof theorem. Remember math and proof theorem? I do. That if, you know, this angle is this and that angle is that, then that proves that this angle is that. That, that kind of formulaic. So this proof theorem is simply that, that when our crack lens of perception is operating, then we will prove ourselves to be right. And that's that horrible boomerang effect, and it'll come back um, at us and distort um, relationships. Right, and pretty right. much it repeats itself with repetition therapy Correct. unless it's directed, and you can't do it by yourself. It's impossible, uh, No, because we have... We have blind spots. Mm -hmm. So if you go to panel number three on the mind map, you can see how all of this stuff encodes and then breaks down because systems that are not sustainable don't uh, sustain over time. So you could see panels four, five, six represent what I call the WTF, the what the Freud. So when our wounds of childhood are ripped open, reactions form, encodings get tripped up, which is our negative core beliefs, and then Boom, boom, boom. Chaos, defenses, and breakdowns. And it's not a pretty sight. And I like to refer to it as the WTF because it repeats. Until and we bring it to the conscious. As a result of chaos, we like to say on the show that we do not, you do not explode or implode, but unload and get on the couch with your emotional ouch with Dr. Judy. Which is what people did yep. with uh, Dr. Dr. Freud. Sigmund Freud. They mm -hmm. got on the couch with their emotional ouch, they didn't did. they? Yes, and they what did. he encouraged was expression and not repression because mm -hmm. a lot of people were mm -hmm. sick. They had symptoms mm -hmm. and they had all kinds of very interesting symptoms, including paralysis, where uh, people came back from the war or didn't want to go to war, and so their legs stopped working. Well, he was looking for the uh, psychosomatic etiology behind mm -hmm. all these symptoms. So he was a medical doctor. Yes, so he, he was. He ruled out organicity. He found, mm -hmm. found out that the person's legs worked, but why couldn't the guy walk? 
while the guy couldn't walk because he was traumatized about going to war. Okay? So, then he started putting these detective clues together, these psychological clues together, and figuring out that these manifestations of symptoms represented some deeper um, concepts. <laughs> and issues. Yes. <laughs> right. Dr. Freud was born in May of 1856. And May what, by the way? May 6th. Oh, close to my birthday. May 6th, I like 1856. It. Okay. And he died in September 23rd, 1939. He spent most of his time in Vienna until the World War. The war came through, and the Nazis threw him out, and he ended up ultimately in London. Um, and uh, he was uh, one of uh, eight children. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was I the favorite. We're going to get to that. Oh, golden child. He was the golden <laughs> okay. child. Okay. Considered himself the first and foremost a scientist rather than a doctor. He endeavored in to understand the journey of the human knowledge and experience. Um, he believed that the origin occurrences uh, had been forgotten and hidden from consciousness. His treatment was to empower his patients to recall the experience and bring it to the consciousness, as you've said, and in doing so, control it both intellectually and emotionally. He, but the problem was, in terms of controversy and the challenges he placed, is we're going to find too much emphasis on the sexual origins of things. Well, that made it interesting for him. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and that emphasis on sexuality was either scandalous or overplayed. And he also did, he talked about psychic energy, the Oedipus complex we talked about, and he did a lot with dreams. Yes, he did a lot yeah, of dream and, interpretation. Um, that, that didn't really pan out at the time, but obviously in the future it, uh, it worked out very well. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things about drive theory. He did believe that the sexual drive mm -hmm. is the most powerful yes, he one. Did. Libido. You know, if you're if you're if you're somewhere, you're there to have sex, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe not quite, but is I that think like the Rolling Stones song, "Love the One You're With"? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can see that. Um, um, Freud uh, had a. Um, concept of eros which is life force and thanatos which is the death force yes and we're always playing against the two forces one, one the, the darkness and, and the, the light. light so i think his eros which is the sexual drive is the uh the powerful urge to recreate and then the death force of course is just the opposite where uh, our, our our life energy is um on the wane we're dying um, so, so again, um, back to the mind map, we're always struggling with the darkness and light. We're always struggling with our feelings. Do we want to bust through them or do we want to just give up? And so we could see it with people who commit suicide. Obviously, the thanatos uh, wins out and people who overcome great challenges and go on to live, the eros naturally uh, is winning out in these uh, uh, cases. Some things you didn't know about Freud was, um, to starting out with, he loved cigars. We're going to talk about this. He first was a chain smoker, and then he found cigars, and he smoked about at least 20 a day. That's crazy. I mean, for cigars, he says it gave him energy, and he, he liked it. Well, for, only... yeah. I mean, for some of you who know this about me, I used to run a stop smoking clinic, and I used to work with people who smoke cigarettes, sometimes 20, sometimes 40, sometimes 60. I don't that's, think I've ever God, met six, anybody packs a day. who smoked 20 yeah, cigars a, a cigars. day. That's a lot yeah. of heavy duty that's a lot of uh, nicotine. Yeah. And as a result, he developed cancer in his jaw and had Not over surprising. 30 surgeries. So a I'm, lot of surgeries. I'm I'm really interested if they have if you have any information on what they thought about smoking and cancer at the time. They that smoking wasn't an issue at all. I mean, it didn't really become an issue until you know years and years and years later. But it doesn't make sense because here's this very very yes. prominent doctor. Yes. He smokes twenty cigars a day. Yes. He gets cancer of the jaw. Yes. And he himself can't put two two and two together. He to enjoyed say, smoking so much he didn't stop. No, I understand yeah. that. Okay, yeah, that's his personal choice. Yes, but he can't make a statement like, hey, um, everyone, as a prominent physician, I think that we have something here that uh, correlates, which is all of the smoking that I've been doing and all the... the uh, Dr. Judy, right? he also loved cocaine, which we're going to talk about too. Yeah, okay, I know so, I know. <laughs> you know, and ultimately he was so much pain. 
um, with um, his cancer at the end that um, he had a doctor, a friend of his, gave him basically a big shot of uh, morphine, and he was uh, basically probably euthanized. You he, think so? Yes, that's yeah. that's in more than one source. But who he, was the friend? His, you know? Uh, sure, it was Associate Max Sucur, S S C H U R. S C S A S C H U R Max. Okay. It was his first name. He reminded him that an earlier pledge not to quote torment me unnecessarily. So uh, now there's nothing but torture and made no sense in light of his pain and his cancer. Yeah. And after receiving permission from his daughter, who Anna, his youngest daughter, yeah. who followed in his footsteps yes, and became did. a psychologist and real big with child psychology, okay. she said, "Okay, fine." And so he was injected the first of three heavily morphine uh, doses and. That was the end of it. How old was he? Well, he uh, it was in his eighties, I think. His eighties, yeah. He, really? he was born. I, don't, I didn't do the age, but yeah, he was born was in nineteen fifty six, and he died in nineteen thirty nine. So Wait, no, no, he wasn't eighties. He was. Wait, uh, he was born in what year? Fifty six. Nineteen fifty six. Eighteen fifty six. Eighteen fifty six. And he died in nineteen thirty nine. So oh, somebody's wow. going to do some math. Okay. Call in. <laughs> it's a call in show. It's eight three two three eight four three two eight two six. So as a result of his chain smoking, as we said, led to over 30 cancer surgeries. And uh, he, he smoked 20 a day. It was a habit. He enhanced his productivity and his creativity. Thought he gave Amazing. Him Amazing yeah. that he was able to uh, do his work and never concentrate. Quit. Never quit. And probably that kept him going. Yes. He worked out of his home. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I believe he did, yes. Yes. And I want to know more about this analytic, uh, psychoanalytic, uh, Psychoanalytic couch. Yeah, we're, well, uh, we're, I think I want one now. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming. The he, Freudian type. He, we of. once, yes, he once thought that cocaine was in a miracle drug. This was about the time that cocaine was in soda. Remember, Coca Cola originally had co co cocaine in it. Yeah, and other stuff. And it was uh, German used it a lot, and also the Germans used. Um, uh, meth a lot too, meth and fen uh, meth, but it rejuvenated and exhila exha exhausted troops, and uh, it it found that his digestion and his spirits improved after drinking water laced with cocaine, but he stopped advocating it after the medical benefits uh, became not really so great, um, and uh, but he still intermittently did it for his migraines, nasal infl inflammation, and his depression. Um, he he was given a wanted to, he was given a hundred thousand dollar offer by Hollywood to work on a film uh, by Sam, Samuel Goldwyn um, to talk about uh, the greatest love specialist in the world about love and he turned it down he didn't do it really no he didn't turn he it wasn't down. interested in Hollywood no he, he wasn't just Hollywood at all and he wasn't he interested was, in America he wanted to analyze yes okay. so his biggest book that he wrote took two years to write was the interpretation of dreams. And it was initially a commercial failure. Hmm. It was uh, considered his most significant work and was published in 1899. And only 351 copies of the book uh, were sold in six years. His famous couch... They didn't have Amazon. They com. didn't have Amazon no, to promote it. No. Absolutely not. His famous couch was a gift from a very grateful patient. He employed hypnotism when he opened up his medical practice in Vienna, and he found it easier to put patients into trances if they were laying down. So when he began to employ his talking cure, and again, I got away from hypnotizing, his psychoanalysis, he also had patients recline on a couch covered with a per Perusian throw rug given to him by a thank you gift from a patient named Madame Benvestini. Which Sounds he took very notes. French, yes. No? Which uh, what could have been uh, from Vienna. Took okay. notes on on a chair out of sight. So that is his big infamous couch. And interestingly enough, it had a rug, big thick rug on it, so it didn't wear out. Right, the rug kind of would protect the couch. Yeah. The Nazis didn't like him either. They burned his books, and uh, he lost four sisters during that whole time uh, in Nazi concentration camps. He studied the sex lives of eels in the beginning. Of eels. And, yeah, thieves thought his his, his ashes were kind of cool. They tried to steal it. What did he learn about the sex life of... Oh, we're going to get to that. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I had that. This is an area I never I knew so existed. So this okay. is things, basically, he discovered. First off, the unconscious, as we've talked about. Nothing comes out of the blue. He theorized that no accidents and no coincidences, even random seeming feelings, ideas, impulses, wishes, events, and actions carry important, often un conscious see, meanings. See, I love that. I think that's brilliant. I think he was absolutely, and I still 
uh, adhere to that, that nothing is a coincident, coincidence. It's, these are coincidence, okay? And you can connect the dots and gain a lot of wisdom about human behavior, dreams, so on, analysis. And I think he was absolutely right on to go into these unconscious places where it was almost like, I'll call it the primordial soup of material for interpretation. And along that was dreams. And, and as you know, your subconscious never sleeps. Right. It's going 24-7. Right. So, you know, there you go. And then and we have theorists who think that uh, dreams are because you ate a bad bowl of soup and had a bellyache or, you know, or you saw a bad movie. And uh, I, I guess that could happen, but... I think it's deeper than that. Oh, I that. agree. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. Yeah. Sexuality is everyone's weakness and their strength. Sex is a primal motivator, as you've stated, and common denominator of us all. So that he spent much uh, time delving into the dark side of our lives. Even the most prudent um, appearing individual struggles greatly against sexual appetites. So, and I think um, he was treating the repressed, the Viennese repressed women, and I'm sure that a lot of his work had to do with sexual repression, and that's why they had neuroses. Yes, they were that was a word of his as well. Right. And one only needs to look at the many scandals that have rocked the Venetian the, uh, churches, politicians, and of course celebrities, which obviously hasn't changed much. Oh. <laughs> and then a big infamous uh, comment, a cigar is never just a cigar, when you talk about the fact of the, that... Uh, one of his theories, which we're getting into, is his oral theory. But in his case, it, there was rumor that uh, he never said that. But, uh, you know, it might be a pacifier. It could be a penis. It could be just a cigar. Yeah, and uh, that's another thing that I love about his way of thinking is that he definitely nailed it on stages of development because we do go through the, uh, the, the oral stage, the thumb sucking, the, the breastfeeding, and then the anal stage, the pooping. You know, the phallic stage, yes. which is when we develop an interest in, in, in um, sex. And so he was the first one to really speak about stages of development. And later, other people followed suit uh, by naming their own stages of development, cognitive development, and Piaget, and other forms of, you know, Maslow's hierarchy and so on, stages of development. Uh, but he was the he one. Got the got, he got the ball rolling. He rolling, got started, man. and everybody's right. you know th thought processes, and they all right. ran with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Every part of the body is erotic. Human beings were sexual beings right from the start. We know the baby nurses, and there's you know all that going on. Um, and he knew that the sexual um, excitation is not restricted to the genitalia as pleasures achieved through erotic achievement to eventually any part defined of the body. So even today, people have great difficulty accepting that as a concept, but that's where he went. That every part of the body is an erogenous, erogenous, erogenous zone, zone. Mm -hmm. right? Which and is another word And sexual energy can move to different mm -hmm. parts of the body. Uh -huh. Thought is a roundabout way of wishing. He discovered that the mere act of thinking, wishing, or fantasizing is itself gratifying. And in fact, what ther therapists and psychoanalysts commonly observe is that fantasy is more mentally and physically stimulating and fulfilling than the actual real-life action is in many instances. Talking cures. This is one of his and his patient who gave him the couch came up with. Um, talking uh, to alleviate emotional symptoms, lessen anxiety, which you've talked about, and frees up the person's mind. Mm -hmm. While meditation and brief therapy can be effective in uh, alleviating these symptoms, talk therapy uses the powerful tool of therapeutic relationship. And again, uh, transference. Uh, yes, and that's another part is that we know that we're wired to connect and mm -hmm. we know that relationship cures. So mm -hmm. he capitalized on that one. Yes, he did. Right. And in terms of the uh, the talk therapy, he really understood that, again, no repression, no mm -hmm. suppression. Mm -hmm. Expression was the name of the game. It's just that he took a little long. I mean, you know, we take 10 sessions. He took a long time. <laughs> a lot more. A long, a then lot here's more. yours. Defense mechanisms is next. Okay. The term defense panel mechanism. Panel five, by the way. Panel, panel five, five of right. their panel. And is so much part of our basic understanding of human behavior that we take it for granted. Yet this is another construct developed by Dr. Freud. 
Um, according to Freud, defense mechanisms are psychological strategies brought into play by the unconscious to uh, mind to manipulate, deny, distort reality in order to protect against feelings of anxiety and or unacceptable impulses. Right. So an example would be his cigar smoking. So... Uh, or smoking or using drugs or anything like that. The defense of using a drug is a way to uh, deal with perhaps unpleasant emotions, and so we may resort to those kinds of things, gambling, uh, porn. Hole in the uh, soul stuff. Yeah, I call it the hole in the soul filler, okay? Right. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. Right. But he was so ahead of his time yes, with all these were. concepts. Yeah. 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 Um, and then to elaborate... Uh, among many types of defense mechanisms coined by Freud, repetition, realization, projection, denial is perhaps most well known. Denial is an outright refusal to admit or recognize that something has occurred or is currently occurring. So, I mean, he impacted a lot. Yeah. Resistance to change is one. Uh -huh. Our minds and behavior patterns inherently resist change and is new and threatening and it's unwelcome. Right, we don't like to get away from the same old, same old, even though panel three, which represents the old system, may be harmful to us. We don't want to undo the system because it promises change, and change is a little scary for some of us, most of us, and risky, yep. and it's out of our comfort zone. And so, again, he was spot on that we... Didn't want to rock the boat. He didn't want to. No, he didn't. didn't want and to risk it, change. His goal was to bring it to the consciousness and defend uh, consciousness and defeat its stubborn ability to create obstacles, forward movement, both in individuals and groups. The past impacts the present. Perfect. Well, there's uh, another one. I mean, these are all just loaded amazing, concepts of amazing. all these from Dr. Freud. I, you know, it's so great that we're doing this show because I myself forget how chock full of. Oh yeah. Of great theory he was uh, really this may seem like a no brainer to yeah. most of us now but more than 100 years ago and it's actually longer this was an aha moment in Freud today many Freud theories childhood development and the effects of early life experiences and later behavior contribute greatly to helping and treating patients whose lives are stuck in repetitive patterns yes correct OCD would be an example. Yeah. Of one. There's a defense yeah. mechanism. Yeah, where people absolutely. Over and over again will um, obsessive perseverate. compulsive behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Transference. We mentioned that word. Uh, an example of the past impacting the present is the concept of transference. Another Freud concept is widely understood and utilized today. Transference refers to very strong feelings, hopes, fantasies, and fears we have in relation to important relationships of our childhood that carry forward unconsciously and impact present day relationships. Right. Again, so, you're talking about, you know, perception and our lens of perception. So there we can is. transfer our paranoia onto another human being. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we still have unconscious, unresolved paranoia from the past, and that could play out in a relationship or at, uh, at work, for example, and really ruin things because mm -hmm. that person who's incomplete in their process of the past is now uh, projecting onto a new person that they intend harm. And so they're going to relate through that crack lens of perception and, again, ruin it for themselves. Another what the Freud. Okay. Development. Human development continues throughout the life cycle. A successful life depends upon adaptability and mastery of change as it confronts each of us. Every new stage of life presents challenges and provides opportunity to reassess our core and personal goals and values. The price of civilization, this is the last one, is neurotic discontent. The price of civilization is neurotic discontent. Go on. <laughs> Is that the con disconnect that he's going to He stated, the, quote, about? the inclination to aggression constitutes the greatest imp impediment to civilization. Okay, because our civilization is set up as it is, that the greatest impediment is that we're not playing panel number seven, right? We're not interconnecting. We're competing with each other. Yes. Gotcha. We want to be loved, but we're not. Right, because we, we would rather be better. Mm-hmm. Than to interconnect or, and so we disconnect. Right. Okay. He did not like America because he thought America had channeled their sexuality into unhealthy obsession with money. 
Okay. okay. It's kind of interesting. I mean, look at America today. It's pretty okay. Like, okay. Uh, America, in, in the end, turned into the most favorable respiratory for his, his ideas and concepts, but he was no fan of America. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Oh. So he was more of a fan of human relations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not such a big fan of the capitalistic way and the overemphasis on money, power, so on and so forth, okay? Now, ba way back in the day, Freud didn't want to become a doctor, but he fell in love. And he knew he couldn't support the woman he loved. He was 26, and he fell mad in love with a 21-year-old woman named Martha Bernays, B-E-R-N-A-Y-S. And they became engaged two months later. Do you think he might have been uh, a little impulsive guy? Where did he meet her? In Vienna. Match.com. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Bad joke. As a poor Bad student joke. still living with his parents, as a science lab job, that's where he studied eels. He did not pay enough to support his family. My sweet girl only pains me to think I should be so powerless to prove my love to you. He wrote to her. Six months after they met, he gave up a scientific career and became a doctor. Very he spent three profession. years training in the Vienna General Hospital and was rarely able to see her. But then after four years of waiting, they were married and they had six children. Wow. Yeah. Even though So he, his sex drive was very healthy. Yeah. Well, it yeah. got more healthy. It did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He, he probably had an affair with his sis, with his sister in law. Oh, okay. So he so, expanded his rise. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes. Interestingly enough, his daughter, Anna, as we mentioned, was a famous and influential psychologist. She founded Child Psych Psychoanalysis and summarized Ego's Defense Mechanism in her book, The Ego and the Mechanisms to Defense. Um, what's interesting is, is it this one? Um, he psychoanalyzed his daughter pretty much her entire life. 10 o'clock, they would go to bed. He would psychoanalyze her and did so until he died. She never married. He scared all the men away. Jeez. Yeah, Speaking of an enmeshed family. Very right? enmeshed with Anna. So he, he didn't really look within, did he? He didn't no. see his, um, his uh, well, let's call it the enmeshment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and how that, that really warped her. Uh, in terms of forming healthy relationships with other men. Well, she was so unmatched, as I mentioned, that when he died, he was given these blessings about doing so, being euthanized by his daughter, Anna. So she was almost more of his mm -hmm. wife than daughter. Well, a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah. He was a very brilliant man. He spoke seven languages. He spoke German, Italian, Greek, English, Spanish, Hebrew, and Latin. Mm -hmm. So he loved Shakespeare and started reading at a really, really early age. Okay. And um, he, he has been known to prove himself to be the kookiest psycholo psycho psychologist ever to walk the earth. So uh, what did his father do for a living? His father you know? was... Um, do you have any info on he that? Was, he, his mother never worked because he had so many kids. He was okay. the favorite, as I said, of all the children. Okay, he was the most golden brilliant. child. He uh -huh. was a golden child. Let's see. Yeah. Um, he was born into, uh, to a wool merchant uh, wool. and his second uh -huh. wife, okay, in uh, part which is now part of the Czech, Czech Republic. Okay, oh, most of his life he was raised in he was raised in, in Vienna, but he was born in Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Yeah, interesting. Wool merchant. Mm. Yeah, wool merchant. So nobody could pull the wool over his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd like that one. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so let's see what else I've got real quick. We can go into some theories. So um, I think this was the one real quick. Yeah, I wanted to get into the yeah, Oedipus gonna, complex gonna, gonna and, and um, electric complex no, no. and anything you have in front of you. We could well, his most famous theory, there. we'll just do this really brief, uh, was the Oedipus complex between 1897 and 99. He just, he dedicated himself to recording his dreams and analysis them in determining roots of his own neuroses, which linked to the death of his father in 1890, 1886. During the self-analysis, he came to the conclusion that his problems were due to a repressed desire for his mother and his feelings of hostility towards his father because of jealousy over his mother's affections, and thereby he, he originated... The Oedipus Complex, which is a, a description of a stage of development, actually, where the little boy uh, falls in love with his mother and uh, in the process wants to um, 
kill the father, proverbially speaking, get rid of dad so he can be united with mom and knock out the competition. Uh, the, the resolution to the Oedipal complex is uh, the boundaries where mother and father put up a united front and say, you know, no, little Jimmy, I'm sorry, but you're not the head of the household. You don't have that much power. You're still a kid. And mommy and daddy love each other and we're your parents, which is the healthy resolution. Because if indeed the little boy wins the Oedipal complex, right, Oedipal um, battle, then what that means is that as a child, he's overpowerful, right? Which we now know it could be the seeds of narcissism, of overvaluing himself and putting too much responsibility on his own shoulders and not letting himself be the child in the family. So it's important that a child lose that battle and defer to um, their parents. The opposite of the Oedipal complex is the Electra complex, where the little girl fall in love with, falls in love with her father and wants to rub her mother out so that she can end up with her daddy dearest. And again, the, uh, the solution for this is, again, the boundaries where the parents recognize these primitive feelings in the child and recognize these primitive uh, feelings of envy and hostility and contain the child, give boundaries to the child, and again, reestablish their executive control in the family structure. So he, he, in a lecture in 1933, he talked about femininity, the theory called penis envy, stated that females become envious of penises as children, and this envy manifests as the daughter's love for her father as a desire to give birth to a son because those who are, close, who are as close as she would be as to having a penis of her own because she couldn't have one. But then he also came up with womb envy. Womb. Yeah, womb envy, or also known as vagina envy. Again, this is the alternative theory that states that men are jealous with women because they don't have a womb, and thus they can't create life. I see. You okay, know. so there's always some kind of envy going on. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I wanted to real quick over this, the, this, the psychosexual stages okay. um, through, through uh, conflict. The oral stage is basically f from one year. The libido is centered in the baby's mouth and they suck on everything. Then they have the anal stage from age one to three, which basically is talking about um, being potty trained. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that determines the child's future relationship with all forms of authority. Yeah. Then we have the phallic stage from ages three uh, to five or six, which is the Oedipus complex regarding mommy dearest. Um, and then in the, in the Electra complex is the penis envy one as you talked about. Then we have the latency stage, which kind of everything kind of just goes latency, and that's where defense mechanisms uh, towards school. And that's where the and cognitive starts. Mm -hmm. so. Cognitive starts. Yes. And uh -huh. then puberty to adult last is the genital stage, basically the last stage, adolescent sexual experimentation, mm -hmm. settling down to loving one relationship in a heterosexual relationship rather than self. Mm -hmm. So... That's real quick, those stages. So, so if you look at the entire spectrum, we're going from an inside job to an outside, right? Where we can be inclusionary of another human being. So first we're alone sucking our thumbs, sucking the breast, and then we're going through our hostile feelings of envy and so on. And then finally we grow and develop to the point where we can include another human being and um, get married, have children with that other human being, have a family, and uh, resolve on it and understand that at the end of the day, um, that the, the uh, letting a, another human being into our lives is maybe not a bad idea after all. Let them in. That's correct. Right. So then he talked about the id, the superego, and the ego. And real quick, the id basically is instant gratification. Yeah. Okay. I want and he it. Gives, I want it now. He gives this great analogy. I'm going to go real quick on mm -hmm. ice cream, which is kind of cool. Okay. So the instant gratification, it operates entirely unconsciously outside the conscious thought. If you walked past a stranger eating ice cream, it would most likely take the ice cream 
for itself. It doesn't know or care that it's rude or, or wrong to take it. You just want it, and you want it now, and there you go. And that's the id. That's the end of it. That's the yeah. id. Yeah. Super ego is basically the conscious, okay? And basically, you still want the ice cream, but now um, you would take it, but afterward, you would most likely feel guilty. Right. Then the, the ego, lastly, is the self, and, you know, at the self says, basically, I want the ice cream. You realize it's wrong. So what do you do? You go buy your own. <laughs> right. Okay. So yeah. the ego is the mitigator yes. center, right? right? Puts it all together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Satisfying mm-hmm. desire mm-hmm. Uh, to make a sacrifice as part of a compromise. Sa- uh, satisfying your desire for ice cream while avoiding the unpleasant social situation and the potential feelings of shame. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting analogy yeah, very in terms of, of that yeah. all kind of encapsulates it. Okay. So okay. Um, that's really about it. And many, they thought many mental, mental illnesses that in place of the id in the forefront of decision making and, you know, psychoanalysis was basically how to fix it. You know, Does it say it. anywhere in your notes about how long an average analysis lasted? I'd like to research more on that. No, it okay. didn't. I mean, yeah, you know, I think it lasted years and years and years. I, I think Sometimes it did. a lifetime. I mean, you know, it was hard to get patients, so he wanted to make sure he kept them. Yeah, he wanted to keep them. And, you right? know, he's just sitting there making notes, smoking cigars. Jeez. Right? Yeah. So right. there it is. And since the patients didn't look at him, they didn't even know if he was awake or sleeping or any of that. Right. Interesting. Right. And Hopefully that's true. he was awake. And yes. analyzing. Right? Yes, but maybe he was going into the dream therapy so he could interpret their dreams. Maybe, right? He was leaving, going into the world of the unconscious so he can pull out information from that primordial soup, if you will. Yeah. Uh-huh. What an interesting man, huh? Yes, he was, and he impacted therapy so a much. lot. So, so, so and, much. And uh, right. 160 later, in Time, Time Magazine felt he was man of the century. I one one of the hundred that. most potent man of the century. Very much, yeah, yeah. and very dignified looking. Yes, and he, you the know, white beard and the, yeah, the hair and the glasses, yeah. and you know, he always dressed very well, very, and yeah. uh, always, you know, always had a cigar with him. So that's basically our Doctor Sigmund Freud on what the Freud for our first show of the year, and now we're going to our segment of shrink that tune where we take a song, and this was kind of a fun song. It was by request. Basically, we have a, uh, a fan who listens to this song because she hasn't been able to get away from her narc uh, relationship, nar- narcissist relationship. Okay. And this kind of it kind of gives her a little break. It's and, called and also, The Weekend. The Weekend. Also, it's by in, The Weekend, can't, can't Feel My Face. In, in tribute to Freud, again, we have a repetition compulsion type of a uh, bad relationship as expressed by the song. So, yeah, go ahead. And I know she'll be the death of me. At least we'll both be numb. And she'll always be the best of me. The worst is yet to come. But at least we'll both be beautiful and stay forever young. This I know. This I know. So here it is, the drive theory. This person is driven to this person, even though it'll be the death of this person, right? Right. And what's most important is um, they'll be beautiful. They'll be able to preserve the, um, the sexual feelings toward each other. She told me, don't worry about it. She told me, don't worry no more. She, we both know we can, can't go without it. She told me, you'll never be alone. I can't feel my face when I'm with you, but I love it. But I love it. Oh, I can't feel my face when I'm with you. But I love it. Oh, I love it. So here's the n- denial. I can't feel my face. I'm numbing out. There's no expression here. Okay, so it's a, a kind of, um, I don't know what's going on, a mask or some sort, but a numbness is coming over the person because they can't really go into the truth of it because it's not such a great relationship. So let's just keep in denial. Let's keep numb. And again, all I know, she'll be the death of me. At least we'll both be numb. And she'll always get the best of me. The worst is yet to come. All the misery was necessary when we're deep in love. Yes, I know. I know this girl. I know. So it just keeps repeating. It's just, it just we're back to the repetitive. <laughs> we're back to the repetitive theory. Right. right. Repetition theory. Right. She told me, don't worry about it. Um, le- I can't feel my face when I'm with you, but I love it. And that's pretty much the song. It's a fun little song. You yeah, hear I love the, words the denial. On it. Yeah, right. To- yeah, 
the love numbness and, and denial. The denial. Yeah. That's by a group called The Weekend, and it's called Can't Feel My Face. So this has been Dr. Judy WTF with Dr. Judy Rosenberg. We are here every Thursday at 8 o'clock Pacific here in Los Angeles at the Sunset Gower Studios. And you can find us on YouTube. We'd love every comment and subscription. And uh, iTunes, um, Stitcher. Um, we're on uh, I, uh, iTunes, Stitcher. Um, what was the other one? Oh, iHeartRadio. Uh, uh, so. And uh, Dr. Judy has her own app on iPhones. It's called... Psychological Healing Center. You can go to the App Store on iPhone for that and get updates on the show, a blog, excerpts from her book, which is Healing, Be the Cause, Healing Human Disconnect, available on Amazon. And it's a great, great book, a great gift for starting out the new year because the goal of it is to help you do exactly what Freud doesn't, and that is think like a shrink. But we do it in 10 sessions. Uh, uh, as opposed to uh, <laughs> years and years and years. And I just want to thank our audience. Uh, thank you so much for your kind and loving words. We get Absolutely. letters every single day. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just do. really, really appreciate your kindness and support of, of us. And hope that you learn something each time uh, you tune in. And for those of you who are part of the mind map process, um, uh, I just want to acknowledge you for the work that you do because it's not easy stepping into healing no, and letting go of the past. As Sigmund Freud says, most people want to stay in denial, but the people who enter our system don't want to stay in denial. And we all know it's more than just a river in Egypt. Yeah. So I'm your host, Walt Lusk, with Dr. Judy Rosenberg of the Psychological Healing Center. She has a plethora of associates to help you on a sliding scale. So if you think you are unable to qualify or uh, afford it, think again. So she does they do phone therapy, lots of Skype therapy all over the world, and of course, on the couch with Dr. Judy at the Psychological Healing Center in Beverly Hills and Sherman Oaks. And teletherapy. Well, yes, Skype and Skype and, Skype and telephone. Yes. You betcha. So yeah. there you go. So thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being a fan. Until next time, God bless everyone. And here's our song. <laughs>